Thank you so much, everybody, and welcome to leg two of the Beast Crawl on day three. This is to live and write anywhere in the world. And our uh, opening musical guest is Blackberry. Youssef, can you tell us a little bit about Blackberry? Yeah, um, one moment. Um, I was <laughs> doing something over on another page. Oh, sorry. I'm, yeah, so I'm just gonna read um, uh, Blackberry's uh, bio that we have up on the web page. Um, that's uh, festival.beastcrawl.com. And um, I encourage you to uh, support Blackberry's work um, on his Venmo as well. So Blackberry is an American treasure, put simply. Uh, some of his recordings are part of the Smithsonian National Folkways Recordings Library. He's a song stylist, tune maker, poet, writer, photographer, health educator, community advocate. Um, born in 1945, Buffalo, New York, Blackberry grew up in Baltimore. He's written and performed for, fil for films, including, and Blackberry, what's the name of that um, film again? Tongues Untied. That's it. That's it. Um, this pioneer appeared on the first anthology uh, of men's on men's music, Wall to Rose's Songs of Changing Men, and Gay Men's Music, Strong Love Song, Gay Liberation, 1972-1981. Uh, so his uh, first album, Blackberry and Friends, finally came out in 1981. Um, so, uh, and then his classic, Eat the Rich, uh, his, that was his classic song. Uh, on that album, finally, is Eat the Rich. Uh, Blackberry's performed uh, music and acted in Marlon Riggs' uh, film, Tongues on Tide, as well as No Regrets, Anthem Affirmations, and Black is Black Ain't. He has toured internationally, has made many radio and TV appearances. Last year, he was given the Entertainer of the Year Award, plus was made Grand Marshal of SF Pride. And these things made him one of the most visible black queer activists in the country. He now lives in Oakland. And remember, support him on Venmo. We got that link coming up. Thank you, Blackberry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go off and up with a song that I wrote for <clears throat> because I found a note that said, "If you want to, if you want to keep in touch with me." Don't lose my number, the boy you met in the back of the bus. <clears throat> I found that note about 20 years later. <clears throat> but anyway, this is a song about having sex on the back of Graham. Called in the back of the bus. Black you can say will only help us go to the course that people can do. Goes like this. Got on the bus in Seattle. I was San Francisco bound. Go to the back. Thought I'd take a look around. Drive to the side. I'm standing in the aisles. Is it the boy with the book? For the boy with the smile, well, the boy with the smile said, you sit next to me. That's who I knew who exactly it would be. I sat by him, he gave a grin. And as I looked into his eyes, my heart began to spin in the back of the bus. The back of the bus. In the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, I made love with God. In the back, in the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, the back of the bus, in the back of the bus. I made love with God. Yes, I did. Now, really, yes, I did. Further down the road, the book boy got off. We smoked your joint together. It was strong and made me call. <laughs> you fell into my lap while moving to the eye. You sat there for a minute with a silly little smile, and then, then you asked a question. You asked if I was gay. I said, 
and you said that you knew that anyway. You waste so much time, there's nothing to discuss. I wanna fuck you, baby, in the back of this bus, in the back of a bus, the back of a bus. In the back of the bus, the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, I'm in love with us. So yes, I do now, really, yes, I do. In the back of the bus, the back of the bus, in the back, in the back, in the back, in the back, in the back of the bus, in the back of the bus. I made in love with God. Yes, I did. Now, really, yes, I did. He tried to do it in the bathroom. It stank and it was much too small. He tried to do it sitting on each other's laps. We would drive, but we would look too tall. When we found the position that we couldn't get it in. You said I waited for this moment, now it's you and I just us. I wanna fuck you, baby, in the back of this bus. In the back of a bus, the back of a bus. In the back of the bus, the back of the bus. In the back of the bus, I'm in love with God. So yes, I did now, really, yes, I did. In the back of a bus, the back of a bus. In the back, in the back, in the back, in the back, in the back of the bus. In the back of the bus, I'm in love with God. So yes, I did. Now we yes I did. We made love from dust till the dawn. All night, child, we really got it on. I came twice and you came thrice. I'm really glad I listened to your very good advice in the back of the bus. The back of the bus, in the back of the bus, the back of the bus, in the back of the bus, I'm in love, in the back of the bus, I'm in love, in the back of the bus, I'm in love with God, in the back, in the back of the bus. Woohoo! Blackberry, unmute yourselves. Give Blackberry a big hand. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, this is a request, so I'm going to do your boyfriend. Is my girlfriend in bed? Every time you hit my mattress, you break it to a big spread. Mm -hmm. Oh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You should see the way he throws those legs up over his head. Mm -hmm. I know he asked if he could do it when he asked you again. That's when the one time turned to two. But now we're on session number 159. What are we gonna do? Child, your boyfriend is my girlfriend. In bed, oh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend. In bed, every time he hits my mattress, he breaks into a big eagle spread. Oh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend. In bed, oh, your boyfriend 
with my girlfriend in bed. Your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Did you just see the way he goes and blows his wig up over his head? Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Well, one day I asked if he would do me. He just smiled and he said, you know the life what I have in mind. Besides, I love the way you feel up inside of me. And I'm having such a real good time. Don't spoil it. Your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Oh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Every time I hit the mattress, it breaks into a big eagle spread. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. You should see the way he goes and goes and legs up over his head. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Well, one penetration is liberation. That's what somebody said. Aren't you glad I liberated you? But now it's time to return that big paper to me. Cause I need liberation too. That's why your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Oh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed every time. He hit my mattress, break into a big eagle spread. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. You should see the way he goes, goes, wake up over his head. Ooh, your boyfriend is my girlfriend in bed. Well, penetration, preparation, that for somebody's dead. Aren't you glad I liberated you? But now it's time to return that the favor to me. Cause I need liberation too. Ooh, dad, now your boyfriend is my boyfriend in bed. Now your boyfriend is my boyfriend in bed. Every time he hits my mattress, I break into a big eagle spread. Now your boyfriend is my boyfriend in bed. Oh, your boyfriend is my boyfriend in bed. Your boyfriend's now my boyfriend in bed. And you should see the way I throw my legs up. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Blackberry. That was awesome. Everybody oh my God. Oh my God. We put, we put awesome. the, the link to Blackberry. We put the link to Blackberry's Bandcamp in the chat screen. Please it's support there. Blackberry. Yeah. Uh, just doing fantastic, fantastic musical work still after you. all these years. We are so honored, blessed, and privileged to have you with us this thank morning, you. Blackberry. Thank and thank, I know you're not a morning person. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for making the time this morning for us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for Fabulous. the All righty. Okay, so there we go. So uh, thank you for joining us for the second leg. This is to live and write anywhere in Alameda. And this we have a cure, uh, our curator for this is the founder of the to live and write group, Bronwyn Emery, who uh, I will, we, we've got a, let's see if we can get the link to your workshop, uh, your workshop site in, uh, because this is the first time we've had an Alameda represented literary group at the Beast Crawl, and we could not be happier uh, to have that happening here. Uh, so I will promptly turn uh, the proceedings over to Bronwyn. Bronwyn, tell us what you got for us today and take it away. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, I cannot even tell you how much of an honor it is just to be considered to be a part of this and be a part of the um, East Bay Lit scene. It's it's uh, personally very, very exciting. And I know that the um, readers I have uh, with us today are also very excited about that. Um, we are uh, we began as uh, to live and write in Alameda. 
um, meeting, connecting on Facebook and meeting in real life in Alameda. That's why the name and then the pandemic hit and we changed it to um, to live and write wherever you are, which includes wherever you are in your writing um, journey and wherever you are in the Bay Area and anywhere else in the world. So we're trying to we're, we're trying to encompass as many as many people who would like a supportive community as possible. Um, so today we have um, four readers. One we had five. One unfortunately can't join us, and we miss her terribly. Um, and I'm going to slide into her spot last. But we're going to begin with Janet Salzman. Janet is a uh, a writer cleverly disguised as a personal trainer and Pilates instructor. She loves flower photos, picture books, carousels, and single malts, although not usually all at the same time. Janet has been an active member of To Live and Write Wherever You Are for several years. She has been a regular contributor to the Flashlit Collective and Alameda Shorts, and in the past year has finished writing one novel and is working on another while that one is in developmental editing. Um, even as she sits down to, re to, to revise the first, she's doing everything that she can to, to construct a second novel, which I think is fantastic. And it's different from the first, which is a very challenging thing to do. And I just, just am in awe of her. We all are. Um, she is the host of our Friday Night Proof of Rights and shares her short stories and poetry on her site, Janet's Random Blog Spot. So Janet is um, by default always first <laughs> when it, when it, because, it's, because sometimes it bugs her. So she is first and you are lucky to hear her, in my opinion. Um, hi, this uh, first story is called Amanda and the Zipline, and I wrote it in one of Ron Wayne's game night workshops, which are really fun and you should check them out. Wait, Amanda said, you want me to do what? Alistair inched away from her as the kid tried to hand Amanda the helmet again. Ma'am, this is a zipline tour. You need to wear the helmet. Alistair, she said with that special sound that only a vengeful deity has. What have you done? You said this was a scenic tour, not some death-defying evil Knievel stunt fantasy. It's perfectly safe, Alistair protested. And look at all the birds and flowers. Amanda was not amused. The kid was a little when she tried to put on the helmet without crushing the hairspray dome of her hair, but he helped the family of four get the harnesses on instead of laughing. Good on the old guy, he thought. And if he's lucky, the old bag will plunge to her death. The hike up from the bus to the first launch platform was muddy. Amanda looked grimly at her formerly white parachis. Alistair, his thin pair legs protruding from his green plaid shorts, whistled. He was sure there would be retribution, so he thought he should squeeze as much joy out of the sin as possible. Amanda watched as the kid clipped the safety line onto Alistair's harness. Off you go, the kid said. My buddy will unclip you at the other end. Alistair clamped one hand on his helmeted head, gripped the rope with the other, and whooped as he sped down the line. Ma'am, you're next, the kid said to Amanda. She sighed. She had considered walking back and sitting in the rusty blue and yellow bus until Alistair was done with his foolishness, but the lack of air conditioning and the size of the insects made her decide to be a moving target. At least, the kid double-checked her harness, and then she was flying. For the first time all day, she felt cool. Flashes of scarlet parrots appeared below her and more different colors of green than she thought possible. A troop of monkeys chittered and stuffed their little faces with mangoes. The sky opened up above her like a parasol. She laughed. And then she clunked onto the landing platform. Alistair was grinning the way he did when he borrowed his dad's Cadillac to take her on a date. That had been a wonderful evening. Amanda wanted to quash him on principle, but she found she was too exhilarated. She let him take her hand as they trekked to the next launch platform. He squeezed it. One of the children was crying. It was scary, Daddy. I don't want to do the rest. Amanda, flushed with courage, laughed to remit the remaining four segments, even letting go once to wave at the bus laboring uphill with a fresh batch of tourists. Alistair couldn't believe his luck. He had got away with it, and Amanda was actually having fun for once. By the time they got to the final landing, Amanda had forgotten all about the mud and the bugs. She cheerfully drank some watermelon aqua fresca and fanned herself with a despised helmet until the kid collected it with the rest of them. And, the kid added, over here we have your souvenir photos available for purchase. Amanda scanned the array, found herself, and gasped. She looked so old, and the helmet was not at all becoming. Then she realized, her hair! Hurriedly, she paid for the photo and the one of Alistair giving the thumbs up, entirely for the purpose of destroying all evidence. 
A few stalls in the picnic area had handicrafts and t-shirts. She bought a scarf embroidered with folk dancers and tied it over her hair. You look so beautiful, Alistair said. You old silly, she replied. I can't believe you got me into this. By the time they got back to the hotel, Alistair had managed to purloin the photos from Amanda's purse. He put the one of himself above his workbench in the garage and hid the one of Amanda with the one from the photo booth at the boardwalk taken on their honeymoon. Her smile was the same. My kid never called me, and of course, my kid called me in the middle of that. So sorry about the uh, phone sounds. I'll just have to wait. <clears throat> this uh, second story is called The Alchemist, and I wrote it, uh, I wrote it and read it uh, a year ago, roughly, um, at uh, Shorts. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Hamlet, act two, scene two. Trip squatted down next to the circle of stones to dump the last load of sticks. The sun scorched the horizon and seeped across the ocean waves. Already the wind was cooler, so he hurried to build the cone of kindling around the crumple of newspapers in the fire pit. The match scraped across the rough rock, igniting the phosphorus rich tip. Even after all his years teaching chemistry, the transformation of inert elements into a blazing liquid flame felt like magic or maybe some kind of sorcery. The students had agreed, at least when he led them out into the parking lot like a line of safety goggled ants to hit tiny balls of phosphorus and potassium chloride with hammers to make explosions. Furley had made him a shirt to wear for that experiment, the fabric printed with fireworks and topped with holes left by stray sparks. He didn't want to think about Furley. The waves sighed in and out. Tripp took a breath full of both the salty, negative ion-laced ocean air and the hint of wood smoke. The ions would scrub some of the particulates from the smoke, producing ozone. His lungs would filter oxygen into his body and carbon dioxide out. The nitrogen in the air just went for the ride. With the fire fed enough to keep it from starving, Tripp slid off his shoes. The sand, mostly silicon dioxide, rubbed cool and rough on his toes. Before he was done, it would infiltrate every cranny of his belongings, almost as if it were some kind of enlarged gas diffusing throughout the available space. He doffed his pants and t-shirt and padded in his trunks to the place where the water needed to land. Where the sand was cool, the water was cold. A chemist working in marine research once said that water doesn't forget. What moves through it leaves biochemical traces behind. Tripp believed it as he picked out the shape of a sand dollar with his flattened dome crushed by a gull's beak, the creature within devoured, and the shell's fragments nudged back into the sea by tide and time. The waves remembered further. She was cold now, like them. Tripp shivered, but made himself wade deeper, to the knees, the thighs. He grimaced while the water pushed and pulled him as if it were frustrated by his stubborn material inflexibility. Maybe it would break through the integument and release the inner ebb and flow of his personal salty, iron-laced ocean. But then he went even deeper, and the water let him choose whether he wanted to root his feet into the earth or drift over it. Deeper still, and the earth let him go, suspended, a little island of itself, floating. He knew he could swim a long time before his body temperature dropped too far. He didn't know if that was good or bad, and felt unwilling to decide in the to and fro of the moment. When he began to shiver, he pushed back toward the beacon he had lit for himself on the shore. Now it was the air that moved him as he moved in it. Jealously, it licked at the wet places, chilling him more. It found the backs of his knees, the crease where his thighs met his torso, the hollow between his collarbones. All those tender spots caressed his fingers even gentler than Furley's had been. He wanted to hurry away from the pain of it, but the sand flung in clumps to his feet. It made him feel like a golem slowly returning to its native earth. Furley lay in the earth, and eventually she would become the earth. He offered the fire some more sticks, and when it accepted, he carefully added a log and another. It leaped and danced, offering him in return sparks and heat. The towel he rubbed over his damp skin released frictional heat as well. Some physicists decried the waste friction represented but Tripp appreciated it for the heat and light it enabled. He was the only one on the beach and it was dark, so only fire, ocean, sky, and sand witnessed him kick off the clammy trunks and push his grittier, saltier skin back into his jeans and t-shirt. Tripp reached into his bag to find his flannel shirt and his fingers found the smooth surface of the whiskey bottle. Time. He brought the fifth out, twisted out the cork to let the spirits escape the bottle and drank. It was good whiskey, smoky, single malt, the result of chemical and alchemical cooperation between the water, the light, the earth's green barley and hops, and the yeast congregating in the air, all brought together to make something else, something somehow more alive than any of those things alone. When the bottle was half empty, he stood carefully on the turning world. Tripp carried the whiskey to the edge of the water. Gripping the base of the bottle firmly, he swung his arm forward, sending a spray of drops through the air to land in the sea. 
He dribbled more of the liquid along the beach as he returned to the fire. The last drops of the spirit blazed up when he gave them to the flames. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. It just goes, gives me the chills all over again. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Janet. So the next reader that we have, the next piece we have, um, Erica Peck is going to read uh, two stories, two short stories. If you haven't guessed already, we um, lean into short stories in To Live and Write. Um, there's also poetry and, and a bunch of other things, all kinds of different ways to write, but I thought uh, showcasing more stories than anything else might be fun this weekend. So Erica Peck is a self-described, mild-mannered stay-at-home mom and lapsed drama major who likes to write stories. She's been an active member of To Live and Write Wherever You Are since 2016 and is currently working on two novels, both in the realms of fantasy and romance. As a longstanding member of the Flashlit Collective and regular contributor to Alameda Shorts, she also allows herself periodic forays into the world of short stories and poetry. You can find much of her fiction and the occasional poem on her blog, Sound Checking the Void. Erica, take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Sometimes my sound doesn't work, awesome. Um, okay, uh, I have two pieces to read and they both started as um, flash lit pieces. Uh, I don't, uh, Bronwyn does uh, flash lit challenge months three times a year, I think it's three times a year. And both of these were born out of the very first flash lit challenge month, month in October, 2018. It's already been that long. And I resurrected both of them later on to read them as shorts pieces uh, the following year. And I'm resurrecting them again now because they both in different ways seem maybe kind of timely. Okay, um, this first one was uh, born out of a prompt called The New Neighbor. Ma, someone's come through the gate. Jasmine laid her knife on the cutting board, wiped her hands on her apron, and peered through the cracked kitchen window. A tall figure strode down the long drive toward the house, leaving a dust trail in its wake. Shotgun from the rack by the door. Get back in the house, Agnes, she called to her daughter, who had darted onto the sagging front porch to lean over the railing. How come we didn't hear the alarm, Ma? Excellent question, muttered Jasmine under her breath. Unexpected company never meant anything good. The Hollands knew the alarm code, but they wouldn't come without sending a message first, except in emergencies. And anyway, this person looked too tall and thin for Kate and didn't move like George. I told you, get back inside, she said out loud. Go in your closet and stay there until I say now. Not waiting to make sure Agnes complied, Jasmine stepped onto the porch. As the stranger rounded the final bend by the oak, she could make out a lean, broad-shouldered physique rugged, travel-stained clothing, and a shock of dust-crusted hair above a face obscured by goggles and a blue kerchief. Jasmine raised the shotgun. The stranger passed the chicken coop and came to stand at the foot of the porch stairs, gloved hands raised. Good evening, ma'am. His voice was pleasant enough, though muffled by the kerchief. That's far enough, said Jasmine. State your name and business. I meant no harm. Moving slowly, he lowered his kerchief and raised the goggles, revealing an earnest, dust-streaked face. Name's Paul. My wife and I just moved into the house next over, a couple of miles east. A cold thrill of dread shot down Jasmine's spine. The Holland Farm. What happened to the people that lived there before, she asked, maintaining her calm facade. He shrugged. Dunno. The place was abandoned recently. Looks like they left in a hurry. We figured it for a safe place to stay at least until after the baby comes. The wife sent some muffins as a neighbor gift. They're in my pack. One hand drifted backwards. Hands up. She jerked the end of her shotgun upward and waited for his hand to resume its position before continuing. What's your business here? Just wanted to meet our neighbors, see if you'd like to trade. He nodded toward the gun. With respect, ma'am, that ain't necessary. I'm a friend. Reasonable people gotta stick together in these troubled times. We sure do said Jasmine, her grip on the shotgun unwavering. Mama, said a quiet voice behind her. Well, hello, miss, what's your name? The man focused on the space over Jasmine's shoulder, his smile wide and friendly. I told you to wait inside, she said, her gaze still fixed on the stranger's face. 
is this your daughter? He asked Jasmine. Is it just the two of you? Or Jasmine ignored his questions and blessedly so did Agnes. I know mama, I got a message just now from Eddie, a request for hospitality. Thank you, baby, back inside. Yes, mama. Message? The man perked up. You got a radio? Not exactly, she said. Alexa, some hospitality for our guest. Trank darts shot from hidden apertures in the porch railing and struck him in the legs, chest, and neck. His knees folded like a bad hand of cards and he crumpled to the ground. My neighbors and I rigged our own system. My daughter uses it to talk to her friends, like Eddie Holland, George and Kate's son. They like to invent codes. They're crafty like that. She leaned over the whimpering stranger and yanked his kerchief down, revealing the jagged blue lines of a Reaver gang tattoo, just as she suspected. How long do we have? Just one meant a scout, but more would come before nightfall. Slack lips released a trickle of drool and several raspy coughs that sounded like laughter. Useless. She stepped back to the shelter of the porch. Alexa, play Despacito. The darts exploded, sending up a fountain of flesh and blown, bone that rained onto the gravel and spooked the chickens into a flutter of outraged chortling. Reasonable people, ha! She spat into the dirt beside the bloody mess of her visitor and went inside to pack, muttering to herself, I was having a good day. We were all having a good day. I was going to make soup. God damn it. Fifty minutes later, Jasmine and Agnes had loaded up the old truck with the go bags and whatever supplies they could easily grab, including their three slowest chickens. Jasmine carefully maneuvered the truck to the back access road and up the switchbacks to the ridge behind the farm. They found Eddie at the designated spot, at the top of the ridge by the lightning split pine. There was no need to ask after his parents. His stony expression and puffy red eyes said enough. Agnes hugged him and cried silent tears. A few minutes later, plumes of dust came down the road from the east and turned onto her long drive. Soon, men with blue kerchiefs swarmed the yard of the house she and Agnes had called home for so long. Jasmine lowered her binoculars, withdrew a small handheld device from her pocket and offered it to Eddie. Would you like to do the honors? She asked. He took it from her, held it to his mouth and said, Alexa, turn up the heat. The sound of the explosion took a fraction of a second longer to reach them than the visual. Okay, kids, show's over, she said, back to the truck. It'll be dark soon and we still need to find shelter. Worse things than those men lurked in the dark, and she didn't really want to watch her home burn. She thought of the carrots still on the cutting board, reduced to ash along with the rest of her kitchen. What a waste. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> it's the first one. I actually Thank turned you. that into, I've expanded on that with several other installments in a longer piece, which is on my blog as The Flightless, if you're, if anyone is interested in reading more of it, that's sort of like an epilogue. So for, uh, you, and Jan Sorry. Oh, for you and Janet, if you would like to, and, and um, Allison, who's next, if you would like to um, put your blog, a link to your blog on the chat, Paul said he will do something helpful with them. Okay. But first, read your, read your second one. Okay. Here's my blog right now. So okay. Uh, second one is called The Plague. Nobody ever discovered the precise cause of the plague. Jack pulled into the hardware store's parking lot, nodded a wordless greeting to an elderly man in passing, and went inside. He quickly found the items he needed and brought them to the cashier light bulbs, a dimmer switch, electrical tape. The clerk, an attractive blonde woman about his age, smiled as she rang up his purchase. Jack liked her smile, so he mustered up his courage and spoke. Once there was a carpenter who lived alone in the forest, he said. The cashier's smile turned sad. Every day the princess walked the halls of her underwater prison, weeping for her lost love. He nodded his silent thanks and went on his way. Everyone who could call it something called tongue, although that appellation was hotly contested among folklorists as unfair and inaccurate, as none of the stories recorded were quite the same as those popularized by the Brothers Grimm. Regardless, the name struck, the name stuck, and the plague spread like wildfire. At the dry cleaner, Jack handed his slip to the man behind the counter. A woman in a green dress stood further down the counter waiting for her own order. She saw him noticing her and cleared her throat. 
Once there was a farmer, she said, who found a cache of jewels buried beneath his barn. Jack sighed. The carpenter was revered throughout the kingdom for his skill. The woman sighed and shook her head. They both retrieved their clothing and left the shop. So many people fell victim that quarantine was wildly impractical. Instead, many of the uninfected barricaded themselves inside their homes, venturing out only as necessary to gather supplies with their heads down and their ears plugged. Many businesses shuddered as their owners stayed home or fled urban centers in an attempt to avoid the plague. Others adapted to their new clientele and thrived. For the infected walked the streets freely, going about their business and sharing their stories with any who would listen. Once there was a virgin queen with rubies for eyes. Jack hunched his shoulders, averting his gaze from the ragged knot of people who approached, murmuring their stories to the air. Once there was a frog who wished for wings, a cow who sang like a nightingale, a fisherman who feared the sea. Their clothing hung from their skeletal frames in soiled, stinking tatters. Their hair fell unkempt into their faces and their glassy eyes stared ahead, but saw nothing. This was the final stage of the plague. Maybe the sight of them should have bothered Jack more than it did, but one of the symptoms of his condition was near unflappable optimism. Scientists searched feverishly for a cure, but their work was hindered by the nature of the plague. Although the infected test subjects could understand normal speech and follow directions, they were unable to write down the stories with which they were themselves afflicted. Any attempts to do so resulted in streams of garbled nonsense, rendering the victims confused and agitated. Despite stringent precautionary protocols, many scientists became infected themselves in the course of their research. Recording devices also served as infective agents. The cure was found by accident. Jack's favorite cafe, like most surviving restaurants, had switched to a pictorial menu so that patrons could simply point to their selections. He ordered turkey on marble rye, chips, and a cream soda, then brought his tray to the lone remaining chair at the counter by the window next to a young woman eating pasta salad. With his first bite, he realized they had forgotten to hold the mayo. It seemed like too much trouble to ask them to remake it, so he scraped the excess off as best he could with a sacrificial potato chip. He muttered irritably to himself as he did so, but instead of the words he meant to say, what came out was, once there was a carpenter who lived alone in the forest. Cutlery clattered loudly against a plate to his right, and a hand closed over his arm. He turned. The woman in the next seat was staring at him as if he had grown horns. Her eyes were wide and her voice trembled a little as she said, the carpenter was revered throughout the kingdom for his skill. He dropped the soggy potato chip, his meal completely forgotten. The carpenter longed for companionship, he said, and so one day he carved a wooden fox. The story spooled out of them line for line. Their fellow patrons caught on to what was happening and fell into a reverent silence until the only sounds in the cafe were made by Jack and the woman completing the story together. Jack could barely speak the last lines, his cheeks hurt from smiling, and they both openly wept. At some point, their hands had met and their fingers entwined. When at last they both said, the end, the entire cafe erupted with applause and excited exclamations in the form of abbreviated story fragments. Unfamiliar friendly hands clapped them on the backs and patted their shoulders as if some of their good fortune might rub off. A strange and glorious pressure had settled in Jack's chest. What to say first? Before he could decide, the woman had seized him by the back of the neck and hauled him in for a kiss to renewed applause and shouts of, once there was. I'm Jack, said Jack, when their lips finally parted. Those two words, the first he was able to choose himself since contracting the plague, tasted better than anything in the world. Or maybe it was her kiss. I'm Sarah, she said, and kissed him again. Jack and Sarah lived happily ever after, making their own stories together until the end. <laughs> Another one of our favorites. Thank you, Erica. Boy, she does a really great job, doesn't she? 
Um, okay, so thank you, Erica. Let's go over to Allison Green. Allison Green's 30 year career in science has been punctuated by blogging for the New York Times, fiction writing, and the adoption of a stubborn rescue chihuahua, Toby. Yeah. As a longtime member of To Live and Write Wherever You Are, Allison enjoys joining writing retreats and taking up writing challenges challenges when she isn't attending to her day job or obeying her bossy dog. She is a popular reader at, July, at Alameda Shorts and is in the early stages of writing her first mystery. Take it away, Allison. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, so for my first piece um, I'm sharing, I enjoy writing personal narratives, um, mostly because I always learn something about myself and it's surprising and this piece on aging was quite enlightening for me. It's called 50 is the best revenge. Confession. I'm terrified of old people. I wasn't always. Visits with my great grandmother were some of the best parts of my childhood. And she was pretty old when I was born, almost 75. The fear probably started around age 12 when my mom voluntold me as a candy striper at the Catholic nursing home down the street raising me into a responsible community oriented young lady was much more convenient when I didn't need a ride. Twice a week I showed up in a ridiculous pinafore and junior nurses cap to hand out magazines and make small talk with the residents. After a month of enduring cheek pinches from the women and occasional fanny pats from the harmless dirty old men, I was deemed responsible enough for the very special privilege of feeding Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, age 100, was the oldest resident in the house of Loretto, and the nuns beamed as they gave me instructions and drilled in the honor of my task. <clears throat> it's just like helping mother feed your baby brother, slowly, a spoonful at a time, and don't forget to wipe her mouth. The epiphany hit when I walked into Mrs. Smith's room and saw a shriveled old lady in her hospital bed, wearing a ruffled pink bed jacket and lace bonnet, her few words quiet and unintelligible. This is the real deal. People didn't get old. They turned back into infants, stuck in cribs, dressed in cutesy outfits. My ingrained manners kicked in, and I politely spooned the gruel into Mrs. Smith's mouth, chattering away as I'd done with my brother. There, isn't that yummy? Just a little more. I mean, no, here comes the airplane, because at least I knew better about that. As an adult, I would not ignore these condescending scenarios, but I was just a kid when I had my Mrs. Smith encounter. And the takeaway locked itself deep into my brain. Getting old sucks. That scarring meal remains the only explanation for what happened one rainy Saturday afternoon just a few weeks later. My friend Jill and I were playing Life, that board game won by acquiring the right spouse, children, and major wealth. Naturally, speculation about our own distant adulthoods came up. I didn't have a specific vision and only knew two things for sure. First, weddings were dumb, but the shock of walking down the aisle in a black dress seemed interesting. And second, being old was horrible. It was better to die before your family dumped you in a nursing home where you'd be dressed in ruffled baby clothes and stuck in a giant crib, waiting to be spoon-fed pureed meatloaf by mortified children. And Jill looked at me more curious than baffled because my friends were used to me thinking about weird future shit. So how old is that? She wondered. How will you know ahead of time? Huh, I'm really not sure. Maybe when I'm pretty old but can still do most things, better to go a little early than too late. 50. 50 seems like the right age to die. Jill freaked out. 50? My mom is 50. She's not old. And she sobbed as my apology just made things worse. And I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. Your mom is great. It's, it's just that my mom's 32 and I didn't my, realize your mom is really old. They both just seem the same old, like mom old. We stayed friends and never talked about it again. And I raised my old age threshold by several decades. But years later, settled down and spared the indignity of a frilly white wedding. I planned my partner's 50th birthday trip to Italy. It was a spare no expense vacation of a lifetime and kicked off her year of embracing the major decade, including a midlife crisis with a new convertible and a blonde who wasn't me in the passenger seat. It wasn't a particularly creative reaction to middle age and my response to the mess was equally pedestrian. 
Mixed in with all of it was my anger at being robbed of my own 50th birthday festivities a few short years away. Would I have to plan my own trip to Paris? Be going alone? With a friend, a new yet unmet girlfriend, or still digging out from the mountain of debt and now single paycheck to paycheck mortgage she ran out and left me with. The reality would not have appeared on the most far-fetched list of 100 possible birthday celebrations. No vacation, no party, just dinner with my brand new girlfriend. Now the realtor wasn't thrilled when I delayed closing for several days, but coming back from the financial and emotional wreckage to buy myself a house on exactly my 50th birthday was better than any trip could have been. That's it. Thank you, Allison. Allison, do you have a second piece to share with us today? I do. And this one, um, this is taken from one of my favorite to live in right in Alameda activities, uh, storied stories where every author takes a specific decade um, and writes about a you know common theme. And this one's about an old house in Alameda. And I had the 1980s and it is called Things That Matter or Blame Nancy Reagan. Paula wiped her hands on her apron, set the sweating pitcher of Long Island iced tea on the patio table, and checked one last time to make sure everything was perfect for her guest. The style magazines she studied like textbooks never mentioned Northern California, as if no homes outside of New York or LA could be fashionably elegant. Not to worry, the cabbage rose patterned cocktail tumblers and paisley serviettes rolled in hand painted napkin rings brought out the greens and pinks in the very green tea cart. The aroma of lemon cheesecake bars wafted through the dining room as Paula made her way to the kitchen. Her little family of French country ducks in their tiny hats and bows, posed in their timeless march across the large sideboard, triggered an unexpected sadness when she absentmindedly brushed her fingertips across the smallest one. She'd resisted moving into this house. When her husband retired from the Navy, She'd had visions of how his career in the private sector would change her life. They'd make friends befitting their new status. Beautiful people who threw classy parties with fancy cocktails and jacketed waiters passing hors d'oeuvres on silver platters. She'd purchased the right workout clothes to get fit. Leotard, headband, leg warmers, and dutifully tuned into the local cable access aerobic program every morning. Her future girlfriends weren't the kind who liked fat, lazy people. Paula's dreams of exclusive garden parties in Pacific Heights intoxicated her, intoxicated her in ways alcohol couldn't begin to match. And when Frank showed her where they'd settle after leaving officer housing, the disappointment was worse than any hangover. It was an all right house, big and fancy and probably fashionable in the olden days, but they'd be staying here in a Navy town, not moving across the bay to the city. He'd pleaded with her to give it a chance. Yes, he'd be in banking, but his officer status only counted for so much. They couldn't afford to live this grandly in the city. Not yet, anyway. Frank had thought it a fine compromise. Humiliated after bragging to the other Navy wives about their new life and worried that the cream of Alameda society wouldn't accept her, Paul had thrown herself into decorating the stuffy old house. Over time, the tired original woodwork gleamed with elbow grease and butcher's wax. Its reflection in the glass cabinets flanking the alcove in the diamond room was charming. And when she found the antique buffet on sale, just right for that space, she had it delivered immediately. The background of the Laura Ashley chintz fabric was the exact denim blue of her newly painted walls. No one would know that she'd made the floor to ceiling drapes and matching balloon balances herself even saving a just big enough remnant to make tiny hats and bows for the wooden ducks. It was all meant to be and enough to make her fall in love with her new home. And now, four years later, they were heading to New York. Everything she wanted when Frank left the Navy was coming true. His transfer to the Wall Street office opened doors to exclusive realtors who'd shown them gorgeous apartments and doorman buildings on the Upper East Side. She practiced looking bored before making those rounds. No one knew them as a retired military couple. They'd arrive in New York as a market and acquisitions partner and his wife from the West Coast office. 
Paula wouldn't be self-conscious about her designer wardrobe or hear giggles as catty military wives gossiped about the not so long ago days when she'd worn a spree. Of course she wanted to go to New York. She supposed her little ducks would still live on the buffet in their Park Avenue dining room and naked without their matching accessories. She'd miss this place after all, but the new owners sounded like people who would appreciate all Paula's elegant touches. Perhaps her expensive drapery wouldn't be wasted. The doorbell rang just as Paula slid the pan out of the oven. She unnecessarily smoothed her large lacquered blonde helmet and opened the door. Sharon, I'm so glad you could come. She threw her arms around her startled guest. You're so brave lending your husband buy a house without you. I'm thrilled to show you around. But first, I have refreshments for us on the veranda. Paula, prattling nervously and focused on carrying the warm tray, didn't notice Sharon walking slowly behind, eyes widening as she took in the stuffy, oversized valances and two precious duck collection. Wait, were those tiny matching hats? She made a mental note to measure the space for the life-size ceramic Black Panther she'd been eyeing. Once the ridiculous chintz was gone, Sharon sh was sure it would be perfect for the space. Hey, Alameda in the 80s. Yep, that's about right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you to Janet and Erica and Allison. Um, Maurice Phillips was going to join us. I, she did, a, I think she was part of the open mic on Friday night. Um, unfortunately, she can't make it now. So um, I am going to read a couple of pieces. Um, the first one is a personal narrative um, that is dedicated to my friend and co and fellow uh, grandmother. So um, it's 4 a.m. on a Wednesday. Alexa, give me 15 minutes. I set the timer and snuggle deeper mm -hmm. under the covers, smug about mm -hmm. the way I just stole back a qu whole quarter of an hour for myself. I will be at my daughter's place by 5 a.m., wide awake and chasing my grandchild. But right now, no one's touching me, pulling on me, swinging me around a day of never knowing exactly what's next. Affection, a tantrum, spilled milk, spontaneous wailing, long afternoon cuddles. It can turn on a dime. Right now, though, I get 15 minutes of quiet, solitude. The silence has mass, thick and heavy and warm. Without even the sun to tug on my eyelids, I purr to the rhythm of my cat's breathing. I get 15 minutes of still, 15 minutes of mine, just me, just mine. I'm not mindful. I'm not prayerful. I don't meditate. I just purr. Humans don't purr, but they do. We do, in the quiet, in the space that is just our space. We grandmothers, we caregivers, we do for others. We are filled up full, exhausted beyond measure, expanding into new definitions of love, leveling up to pad the edge of dystopia with warm embraces, gentle rocking, calming voices. Puzzles on the floor, bubbles in the yard, classrooms on the screen, on several screens, one screen per kid, juggling time, juggling attention, keeping the children safe and fed and occupied through one never ending march of the pandemic. We dish out breakfast, lunch, and discipline, sit through preschool songs and Pixar movies on an endless loop. It's shift number two of motherhood, harder and more demanding than we signed up for, but we do it, this time with more freedom to play, but less energy, more wisdom to share, but less of a say. Our daughters need us. To keep the lights on, the bills paid, the insurance current, our daughters work from home or work their gigs or work on site. And we, the lucky ones who live nearby, watch the kids. It's not our turn to raise the kids. We had our turn, we raised our kids. These kids have their own mothers. For now, you're just doing the work. We count our blessings. We tell each other, we're counting our blessings. Someday we'll be grateful. Today we're grateful, but we're also in the thick of it, the shit of it. This is a long con, a long slog, and one day we'll be overwhelmed by gratitude. The relationships that grow from this kind of entwining are precious and too rare in a society that preaches independence and separate nesting. But today, 15 minutes alone is what's precious and rare. So delicious, I can taste every full second of it. 
Leaning into the joys of grandparenting, we snap pictures and post smiles and record the days with pride, latching onto the ups, shaking loose the downs when we can. At night, every cell in my body is wiped out because at 4.15, I'm making my bed. At 4.55, I'm driving. At 5 a.m., I'm picking up toys and pulling the living room back together for my daughter, who ends her 12-hour days at 60% pay, so very tired in her own bones that housework can go fuck itself. That's what I tell her when she comes downstairs with tears in her eyes, ashamed and sorry the house is a mess and the sink is full of dishes. Housework can go fuck itself. She only has a few hours a night to play with her child. Housework can go fuck itself. I haven't cleaned my own room in months, so many months, since the pandemic began, because I escaped my lover most weekends, work on my business at night, and smuggle 15 minutes into my bed instead. But I make my bed at 4.15 because my grandbaby will be up and running around and pulling on me and climbing on me and getting into things and losing his shit and laughing his ass off all day from the moment I get there to the moment I leave a dozen hours later. Coming home to my neatly made bed is like falling into heaven. It's a relief and a pick me up all in one. I'm too tired to make dinner. I change into pajamas, climb on my bed, set up my laptop and open Zoom. It's time to work to run a workshop, meet with a client, check in on members and their mental health and their creative health, or study for the next certifi certification. I have my own business. I have my own life. I raised my children. I have a life, but my daughter has me, and this is what that means. Thank you. Um, and one, one more, um, I'm sorry, Allison, I didn't realize that you were gonna do one of your um, storied stories. I'm gonna do one of my storied stories. Um, I wrote a poem for today, but it's very short and we need to fill out, fill out time. And it's also the only poem I've written in maybe 40 years, 30 years. So I'm not gonna do that to you. Um, <clears throat> the next piece is um, from the same storied stories uh, challenge that Allison read hers from, but I had the 1950s. Same house, the 1950s. Dolores walked briskly to the built-in cabinets in her dining room, the clip of her day heels on hardwood carrying her forward to her task. She slid open one of the drawers and withdrew two sets of stationery, an ivory-handled letter opener, and her favorite gold pen. She turned and set them on the table, settled into her chair, and picked up the mail from its silver tray. She shuffled quickly through the envelopes, mentally ticking off household bills and personal letters. She got to the end and closed her eyes. She would make it through another day without a dreaded telegraph. Dolores told herself to breathe. A prayer came forward, offering itself for comfort, but she pushed it away. She refused to jinx Harry's life like that. Instead, she drew a strong breath, straightened her back, and called to her housekeeper. I'll take coffee now, Martha. Dolores went through the household bills first, one ear on Martha as she bustled about the kitchen. When the woman entered the room, Dolores put the bills off to the side, face down, and picked up a letter from her sister. Martha placed the tray on the table within Dolores's reach. She lifted the sleek white carafe and poured the first cup of coffee. She added cream and laid a small silver spoon on the saucer, then returned to the kitchen. Dolores, distracted by her sister's engagement announcement, nodded her thanks. She said to the black cat that had appeared out of nowhere to watch her from the window seat, let's hope this one sticks, and made a mental note to share the news with her husband, Owen. Half a cup later, Dolores set the last of the personal letters aside and pulled the plain white stationery to her. Harry had made it abundantly clear that he would never again be caught reading a letter printed on flowery pink paper from her. He had said, gee, mom, I would hate to have to throw a letter from you overboard, but I would. Girly paper is fine from a man's girlfriend mother, but not from a man's mother. Dear Harry, she began, having also been forbidden from using dearest or darling, I have received more interesting information from your Aunt Jane about your great-great-grandfather Edward. When he returned from the war, he did not give up on his dream after all. Articles with his byline begin to show up within just a few years of his return. Your life will be different when you come home, but there is so much to learn from him about beginning again and holding fast to what you are called to do. Dolores filled two pages with stories about Edward, infusing every line with how this ancestor survived his military career, went on to build a life with layers of meaning, and left a legacy of character that Harry could inherit with pride. 
Dolores didn't care whether Harry enjoyed these family history lessons. The ritual was for her benefit. What had begun his idle interest, had anyone else on her side of the family sent a son to war, had changed abruptly into obsession, triggered by the discovery that in all the generations recorded, every single one of the sol soldiers and sailors in her line had made it home alive. Dolores found herself on a mission to prove to herself and God and fate that Harry had indeed inherited a charmed life through her, that it was his actual birthright to survive the Korean War. She goaded and invited relatives into sharing memories, newspaper clippings, official documents, and even rumors about their fathers and grandfathers, and used every word to help her call the ghosts of her ancestors to watch over her son. Dolores took their stories and wove them into an invisible net of protection, casting and recasting the legacy of survival over her son with every letter she sent. Dolores signed off with love and affection and drew a tiny black paw print in the lower left-hand corner of the last page and winked at the cat who winked back. To Harry, it looked like the cat was sending his love. To Dolores, the symbol was another seal of safety on her son's life. She drew another deep breath and moved on to write a letter to Owen. Staring at the photograph of him in his captain's uniform, Dolores deliberately chose the pink stationery. She wrote through a second cup of coffee and two chocolate mint cookies. She updated her husband on the weather, the garden, her sister's engagement, and repairs needed to the roof. She then practiced a growing gift for erotica, knowing it would capture his interest immediately, completely. Dolores sealed both envelopes. She placed the plain white one for Harry on the silver tray. Martha would add the stamp and see it delivered to the mailman. She carried the pink envelope to the built-ins with the remaining stationery. She opened the drawer. She put the paper, the ivory-handled letter opener, and her favorite gold pen back where they belonged. Dolores then unlocked one of the lower cabinets and, kneeling, withdrew a shoebox overflowing with letters to Owen. She murmured a promise of love over the pink envelope and added it to the box. She returned the box to the cabinet and locked it. Taken 10 years ago by a different war, Owen had been a product of his line. His line did not survive. Dolores considered it her duty to keep his memory locked up and distracted until their boy came home. Their boy would survive. Dolores returned to the table. She picked up the last of the cookies, set the plate on the floor, and poured the rest of the cream for the cat. That's it. Paul, we're a little bit early. Um, That's what would you like right. us to talk about? Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I can, I can, I, I've got a little small talk and a little chatting and house cleaning and details. I can take a few minutes and then actually people can take a few minutes, a few minutes break. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you to live and write anywhere in the world. Uh, Bronwyn Emery, Allison Green, Erica Peck, and Janet Salzman, and, and, and in spirit, you. spirit Maurice Phillips. We miss Maurice today, but because yes. um, Maurice, but uh, really, really excellent stories that you guys, thank you for bringing Thank you, thank you for bringing the top shelf work today. That's we really appreciate that and having you share that with our larger community. Um, and a good thank topic. you so much for including us. And um, uh, I'm sorry. And while I'm doing this, Bronwyn, if you have links to drop into the chat screen, please do that. I've I've been I've got a little sidetracked. This <laughs> is outside business. That's okay. Well, I'll do that, uh, going on. Right. I, yeah, I, I keep the headphones on so I can hear you guys while I'm running around, but uh, it's it gets a little crazy sometimes. Um, I did, but uh, I did want to say I just posted uh, the link to the next the, the next leg of the beast begins uh, in about fifteen in about uh, twelve to fifteen minutes, and uh, I posted that link so you can join it there, and I'll repost that again. But also a real quick thing uh, because we are fundraising um, for Beast Crawl, uh, and we are because our in the in the coming year we want to be able to pay our readers at some point, and that is something we are looking forward to being able to do. Uh, but in the meantime, we're we're building up that little uh, we're building up that little uh, nest egg uh, all throughout this festival and probably all throughout the next year. For those of you who have supported us, thank you so so much for all of your generosity. You've, some some of you folks have T-shirts on the way. Uh, just so you know, donations of twenty five or more get you a T-shirt. That's that's the deal with uh, with what we got. There's the like public television. <laughs> it is. It is public television. That's exactly what it is. I in fact, there's been a marathon going on PBS right now, and I just take really? notes. That's so. That's when you don't see me. I'm going. I'm taking notes from the PBS fundraiser. <laughs> I'm just coming back here to share that because I, you know, because otherwise I've never heard this. I've never heard this spiel before anywhere. 
Um, right. But it's uh, but anyway, there's our GoFundMe. We're a GoFund. We we are we are so close. We are we think we're very close to fiscal sponsorship. We hope to have really good news on on that within the month to come. But in the meantime, uh, we want to be able to pay our writers. That's that's important to us. Uh, thank you for your volunteering your time today for this for this festival, this return of our festival online, not in person. We're guessing we probably won't be in per if, if we are in person sometime within the next year, uh, it might be in just one venue. Uh, if, uh, if, 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 I don't know, if we get really lucky, maybe we can have a true crawl late next year. We don't know. That's, everything is in flux in terms of uh, public health safety protocol. We yeah. take it very seriously at these crawls. There's not only yes, Delta, you, there's not only Lambda, but now there's talk of Moo. So, Mu, don't, I don't even hear about Moo. Moo's from the past. Oh, man. Moo is the, Moo's the ancient continent. I, I don't need We're not talking continent. about the illustrious island of Moo. No, guys. Well, get me started. I am kidding. I'm kidding. I'm trying to. I'm trying to sidetrack this conversation off of uh, you know, stuff. So anyway, you got a great uh, yes. show coming up. We got a great show coming up. Hashtag we queer perspectives. And real quick, uh, I will do. Come on now. Um, I'll do a quick share screen here and just show people what's on tap for the rest of the day. Uh, we've had. We've got through Black Bear. Thank you so much to live and write. Uh, like through hashtag we uh, queer reading series is running uh, two to three with a musical guest uh, coming on in about 10 in about yeah in about 10 to about 10 minutes no probably about 15 minutes uh, Christian Avasias yeah he's our uh, friend from Ecuador our friend from Ecuador a musical guest singer, from Ecuador. songwriter and storyteller and poet and he's amazing and I believe right. he speaks a little bit of English but he's probably going to regale us with his poetical songs yes. in Spanish so looking and that's to that. and, and 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 we are and we are all here for that. Just before we go into the hashtag, we see uh, we reading series curated by Richard Loringer, uh, who some of you have seen perform marvelously this weekend. Uh, and who's also reading? Uh, who I know is also reading and signed up for the open mic tonight as well. Uh, Lake Four uh, music. The uh, musical guest will be from Mexico City, Madam Chang, who opened for us on Friday night. Uh, in the gala opening, and that blew people that those guys that band blew people's. I know doors she off. knocked our socks off, but she might uh, be doing something a little bit different. We'll find out exactly. Well, well, she, she's going she's gonna have it figured out, that's for sure. Yeah. And that'll lead right into speaking a lot with uh, the the reading series curated by Josiah Louise Alderete that he does at the Oakland Peace Center. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Lake Five, uh, our our final curated reading of the festival will be from my, my word that is uh, curated by Kellyanne Parker and Elaine Brown. Uh, musical uh, musical guest opening, Adro Romero. Uh, before the is great. So she's gonna yes. work with the guitarist and maybe do some accordion. Yep. And, uh... and then last but not least, the Jay DeSalvo pedestrian open mic. We are, we're, we're, memori we're, not, we're not, it's not an open mic where we memorialize Jay, although some people are going to do that because it's the first time, but you can read about anything. You can come to this open mic and you can read about anything, but this open mic will persist and will remain named after Jay DeSalvo going ahead. Just like our Friday night open mic is named after Reginald Lockett and the Reginald Lockett series will continue forward as a part of the Beast Crawl going forward. Just oh, that's great. that part of the day. So there that's we go. Great, uh, well, We've got a really special treat um, from the uh, Afro surrealist um, writing group. Right. Oh, I missed that. Particular yeah, storyteller. Is she bringing in other people, or is it just going to be uh, Ellen? We have a. Um, let me see here. I, let me just. Let me just say, um, his, his name is Gabriel Akata, and okay. he'll be reading some of his um, some one of his short stories or a portion, and it's going to be really cool. So we're looking forward to that. Okay, and people are asking about a links a sign up to the a sign up list for the Jay DeSalvo Memorial Open Mic. I have just posted that in the chat screen. Okay. If if you want to sign up for the open mic tonight, hit that link in the chat screen, and you can sign up for the open mic. You can also sign up for that open mic on our on our website. That's yeah, directly on the website. Yes. So just so folks know, so uh, that's it. Uh, that's that's that's. I think we're good, and we can maybe take a quick break and grab some drinks. And, uh, and and grab some uh, you know a couple of refreshments and things deep before we start the next reading in just a few moments here. But uh, I will post that link to that next leg right here one more time in the chat screen. That's where we're going to be. We'll open up that room in about six minutes. Thank you so much to live and write anywhere in the world. Thank, Thank you, Blackberry. You so wonderful reading. Wonderful music today, Blackberry. We have so loved how we want to have oh, you back. Blackberry. We want it. We want to bring you back, especially when we're paying people. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys take care and hopefully we'll see you later in the festival.